First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello. Hello. Can I speak to Eleanor, please? This is Eleanor speaking. Hi. My name is Jan. I'm calling about the car that was advertised on the notice board in the Student Union building. Is it still for sale? Yes, it is. Your ad says it's a 1985 Celica, in good condition. It's old, but it has been well looked after. My family has had the car for 10 years. I'm just the third owner and my mother had it before me. So we know its history. We've got all the receipts and records. It's had regular maintenance and the brakes were done last year. It runs really well, but looks its age. Why are you selling it, by the way? Well, I'm going overseas next month to study. I'll be away for at least two years, so I have to sell it, unfortunately. It's been a good car. You want $1,500, is that right? I was asking $2,000, but since I need to sell it quickly, I've reduced the price. Would you like to come and take it for a drive? I don't live far from the university. Yes, I'd like to have a look. What time would suit you? Any time this evening is fine. Um, well, I finish classes at 6 o'clock. How about straight after that? Say, 6.30? Great. I'll give you directions. When you leave the main gate of the university, turn left on South Road and keep going until you get to the Grand Cinema. Take the first right. That's Princess Street. I'm at number 88 on the right. So it's 80 Princess Street. No, it's 88 Princess Street, and the suburb is Parkwood. You'll see the car parked in front. It's the red one, with the for sale sign on it. OK. Thanks, Eleanor. I'll see you later. Bye. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Later that day, at the university, Jan meets up with her friend Sam and tells him about the car. Hi Sam. Hey Jan, what's happening? I'm glad I ran into you. I've decided I have to get a car. You're going to buy a car? Do you really need one? I'd probably still be driving except that my car broke down last year. Instead of getting another one, I just moved closer to the university and went back to riding a bike. Better for the environment, better for my health, and I save a lot of money. Did it really cost that much? Well, when you think of registration, insurance, rising petrol costs, parking plus maintenance and repairs, it adds up. Mm, I know it's going to be expensive, but I really need my own transportation. It takes half an hour by bus each way to university as it is. But now I'm working at night in the city. There's no way I want to hang around waiting for a bus late at night, then walk three blocks home alone. Hey, I think you've got a point there. So what kind of car are you looking at? It's an 85 Celica, same kind as I used to have. The owner's asking $1,500. That's pretty old. How many kilometres has it done? You know, I forgot to ask. I'll have to check tonight when I go to see it. Would you be able to come with me to have a look at about 6.30? Sure, I'll come, but I don't know a lot about cars. I do know one thing, though. I wouldn't buy an old car without having a mechanic look at it first. That's a good idea. But won't it cost a lot? Not really. You can get a check done through the Automobile Association for $80, and it comes with a report on the condition of the car, 
It can save you a lot of money in the long run. I'll keep that in mind. So we have to get to Parkwood at 6.30. Do you want to take the bus? It goes straight down South Road every 15 minutes. Or maybe we could walk. I don't think it's that far. Actually, I could borrow my roommate's motorbike for an hour or so. He's working all evening in the library. Do you think he'd mind? No way. He owes me a favour or two. OK, great. See you at six, outside the student centre. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two flatmates, Tom and Richard, talking about their new flatmate who has just moved in the week before. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hi, Richard. I'm glad I caught you here. Can I just talk to you about something? Our new flatmate, Anders, is not quite what I had hoped. I was wondering if you shared my concerns about some of his behaviour. Uh, yes, Tom. I, I know what you mean, but we can't be entirely negative. He, he has good points. I mean, at least he's quiet. He doesn't play loud music all night or bother others or turn his TV up, disturbing everyone. Sure, he's quiet. But remember our last flatmate? He'd say hi to you and smile and treat everyone politely. In comparison, this new guy is very impolite. He just grunts in reply and sometimes ignores me altogether. I guess that's just his way. You know, just his character. I don't think he realises he's being impolite and it shouldn't matter to us too much. We can just ignore him too and quietly live our own lives. But his friends are hard to ignore when they visit. I know what you mean, but how often does that happen? I rarely see them, maybe once or twice a month. If they came more often, it might be a problem. But as it is, such rare visits don't matter so much. Wouldn't you say so? Well, I'm not sure, since it's very obvious when they're here because of all the cigarette smoke in the house. It stinks up the place, and you know we don't allow smoking on the premises. Well, I've never seen them doing this. Maybe they do it outside. Perhaps we can talk to Anders about it. Always remember, though, in one respect, he's a good tenant, and it's the most important aspect. The previous flatmate would always pay the rent late. I know what you're going to say. This guy pays promptly. But there's more to being a good tenant than prompt payment. I mean, you need to turn off the TV, clean up your dishes, dress respectably, be polite, and so on. I guess what I'm saying is that, basically, you need to cooperate with the others, and this new guy fails significantly in this respect. OK, I suppose you have a point there. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. I tell you what, Tom, why don't we talk to our new flatmate, Anders, about these issues? If we throw him out, we'll have to go to all the trouble of finding another flatmate, who might not necessarily be much better. 
So, let's give the current guy a chance. Here, I've got a piece of paper, so let's make a short list of issues to discuss with him. Get it out into the open. Sure, we'll give him one more chance. So, write communication, and let's tell him to... Well, we can't change a person's personality overnight. So why don't we have a weekly tenants meeting and we can just ask him to attend. That way we can get to know him better. I'll write attend meeting and we can take it from there. OK, a y but we have to tell him about his friends. They can't just do whatever they want. Write a heading friends and then write don't smoke anywhere inside or outside. Well, instead of being so direct and possibly causing offence, I'll just write... follow rules and verbally mention the rules TV off by 10pm no loud music or bad behaviour including smoking OK, a y do that but I still think we need to specifically mention that last issue you know how I can't stand the habit so I'd like this to be another and separate point cigarettes, strictly forbidden and it's important to include the strictly here we can't pussyfoot around too much sometimes directness is necessary OK, a y I'll write that. Forbidden. OK, a y and what about cleaning duties? Anders is a little too relaxed about that. Dishes are sometimes not washed, dirty teacups are left around the place, and so on. So, write, must do better. Yeah, again, Tom, he might take that personally, and it could cause a scene. I'd rather be general. I'll write, must be done. And I'll tell him that that's for everyone, not just him. OK? a y OK. a y As long as he gets the message. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear part of an interview between Dr. Hilsden, a member of staff on a fashion design course, and a student, Julia, who is applying to do the course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23 on page 130. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Right, Julia. So, from your CV and portfolio and what you've already told me, you seem to be very much the sort of person we're looking for on the postgraduate course. So tell me, you finished your fashion design course in London four years ago. Did you think of carrying straight on and doing a higher degree at the time? Yes, but there were financial pressures, so I ended up working in the retail industry, as you can see from my CV, mm -hmm. and actually it was a very useful experience. Hmm. In what way? Well, I was lucky to get the job with Fashion Now, they're a big store, and one of my priorities was to get as much experience as possible in different areas. So that was good, because I had the chance to work in lots of different departments. And having direct contact with the customers meant I was able to see how they reacted to innovation, uh, to new fashion ideas. Because with Fashion Now, a designer might show something in New York or Milan, and there'll be something similar in the shop within weeks. So that was probably the most useful thing for me. Right. And so what's made you decide to do a postgraduate course now? Um, well, while I enjoyed working at Fashion Now, and I learned a lot there, I felt, uh, well, the way forward would have been to develop my managerial skills. 
rather than my skills in fashion design, and I'm not sure that's what I want to do.、Mm, yes. When I was doing my degree in London, I'd been interested in women's wear, but I know that there's been a lot of work done in areas like new fabric construction. And though I'm not intending to go too deeply into the technology, I'd be very interested in looking at how new fabrics could be used in children's wear. So I'd like the chance to pursue that line. Yes, good. And are you at all concerned about what it's going to be like coming back into an academic context after being away from it for several years? No, I'm looking forward to it,、oh. but I'm basically more interested in the application than the theory, or at least that's what I've found so far. And I'm hoping the course will give me the contacts and skills I need eventually to set up my own enterprise. I'm particularly interested by the overseas links that the department has. Yes, many of our students look overseas or to international companies for sponsorship of their projects. You now have some time to look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-four to thirty. And the facilities here look excellent. I just went to look at the library. It's really impressive. There's so much room compared with the one at my old university. Yes, most students find it's a good place to study,、mm. and there are link-ups to other universities, of course, and all the usual electronic sources. The staff run an information skills program, which we recommend all postgraduates do in the first week or two. Design students find these special collections particularly useful. Yes. Then we have a separate computer centre, which has its own academic coordinator, Tim Spender. He's got a background in art design, and the ethos of the centre is that it's a studio for innovation and creativity, rather than a computer laboratory. Oh, right. I liked the study spaces where students can sit and discuss work together. Very useful for joint projects. We always had to do that sort of thing in the cafeteria when I was an undergraduate.、Mm -hmm. And I read in the brochure that there's a separate resource for photography. Yes, it's called Photo Media. It's not just for photography, but things like digital imaging and new media. It's a resource for all our students, not just fashion design. And we encourage students to work there, producing work that crosses disciplinary boundaries. It's well used. In fact, it's doubled in size since it was set up three years ago. And we also have an offshoot from that, which is called time-based media. This is for students who want to develop their ideas in the area of the moving image or sound. That's in a new building that was specially built for it just last year. But there are plans to expand it, as the present facilities are overstretched already. Right. Now,、uh, is there anything you'd like to ask about the course itself? Um, I know it's a combination of taught modules and a specialist project,、mm -hmm. but how does assessment fit in? Well,、uh, as you'd expect on a course of this nature, it's an ongoing process. The degree course has four stages. And there are what we call progress reviews at the end of each of the first three. Then the final assessment is based on your project. You have to produce a report, which is a critical reflection on your work. And is there some sort of fashion show? There's an exhibition. The projects aren't all focused on clothes as such. Some are more experimental, so that seems more appropriate. We ask representatives of fashion companies along, and it's usually well attended. Right, and another thing I wanted to ask. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Section 4. In this section, you will hear a lecture on the research on teen brain. Now you have half a minute to read the questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Today our guest is Joseph Parks, Medical Director for the Botany Department of Mental Health. He's going to give a lecture about the research on teenage brain. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to introduce the new research about adolescent mind, the teenage brain. How much do you know about that? Do you believe in brain scanning? Do you think we can judge whether a teen is normal or mentally ill? Or it's just another immature test? The new research shows a teen brain is in the middle of disordered changes. Those changes, scientists now believe, are so significant that they may reveal the mysteries of mental illness, explaining why some teens commit suicide, why others harm their classmates, and why some emerge later in life with mental disorders. The research looks forward to a day when teens could be tested for suicidal depression as easily as they are for heart disease. But there are signs that society and parents in particular would reject such a tool. Many parents question the validity of a mental health diagnosis. They fear that their children will be falsely tagged with a mark that he or she is abnormal. At the centre of the debate is the teen brain. Its confusing architecture and the difficult question of what's typical in a teen and what's not. Under the old thinking, the adolescent brain was fully formed, needing only to be filled with facts, figures and experiences to become an adult mind. At the same time, many people rejected the idea that young people were even capable of developing mental illnesses. However, the new research shows a teenage brain is an organ in transition. It has an unstable and vulnerable composition. The evolving teenage brain clearly isn't adult-like until the early 20s. If teens act young and stupid, it may be because brain areas that govern rational thought are not mature yet. All that is fine when the brain develops normally. But if the teen brain fails to successfully reinvent itself as an adult brain, mental illness may happen. Researchers increasingly believe if that process stops for some reason, teens are likely to develop mental illness. Early warning signs might be disregarded, as adults may think them the typical teen behaviours. Perhaps the chief hope of the new research is that it could make a difference for teenagers suffering from mental disorder and major depression. These can lead to suicide, which for years has been the leading cause of death for teens. Until recently, scientists couldn't peer into living brains to look for changes associated with normal development or mental diseases. That is beginning to change as researchers develop ever more sensitive brain scanners. However, the composite pictures are somewhat misleading. A snapshot of an individual brain may fall somewhere between normal and mentally ill. For now, psychiatrists and psychologists must still rely on interviews and observations of children's behaviour to diagnose mental illness. That is the end of section 4.